Almighty God, who sent your servant, John the Baptist, to prepare your people to welcome the Messiah, inspire us, the ministers and stewards of your truth, to turn our disobedient hearts to you, that when the Christ shall come again to be our judge, we may stand with confidence before his glory, who is alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Mark. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That little sentence Sounds to us perfectly ordinary. Yes, it's the beginning of the good news. Let's, let's get into the meat of it. Let's get into what it's about. And Mark's gospel does move very quickly, and he does get into the meat of it very soon. But actually, that opening sentence, that right there is the meat of what this gospel is about. Arche evangelium to Jesu Christu Dominum Nostru. The beginning of the good news, the evangelion, evangelism in English. Why is that phrase, that short phrase, an explosive sentence? And it was explosive. It is explosive. Why? Why the beginning of the good news? Well, what is evangelion? What is good news? In the ancient world, in the Roman Empire, it was a word that was typically used to describe an imperial victory. When Caesar defeated the Gauls, he would have sent an evangelist back with the news to Rome. When Augustus and Mark Antony, mostly Mark Antony, Augustus got the credit, but Mark Antony did most of the work, when they defeated Brutus and Cassius, they would have sent an evangelist with the Weangelion, the good news, they would have sent them back to Rome with that news. It is the announcement of victory. Victory for the empire. Victory for the king. And this is the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, here again. Mark is co-opting an imperial term. The Son of God, ever since Augustus, the Son of God was used to describe the Emperor. The Emperor. And so here we have, in just the first sentence, Mark claiming the victory of Jesus, the Son of God, taking all of the Emperor's thunder. And this written by a man who was most likely in the city of Rome when he wrote this, the city where his friend Peter had been executed the city where his friend Paul had been executed, the city which had, by all outward indications, utterly crushed Christianity and proved it to be weak and futile 
and useless in the face of imperial authority, and yet here Mark is in that city, writing these words, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It is earth-shattering stuff. Caesar's power is no more. Oh, it may look like it holds sway. It may have all of the outward show of an empire of strength, whether that Caesar is Augustus or Tiberius or Nero, or whether it is empires that followed Spanish or British, American, Soviet, doesn't matter. Those empires may still have the outward show of power, but the true king has come and has won a victory. Mark is about to tell you about the victory. Now, the fact that Mark's gospel ends with the empty tomb and the women who came to the empty tomb running away in fear tells you all you need to know about the strange king we serve and the kind of victory that he won. As I said, Mark comes to his point quickly, and onto the stage strides John the baptizer. And he is crying like a voice in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Prepare the way of the Lord, this Lord, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Prepare the way for the Lord. Now, this line from Isaiah came out of the exilic period, when the people were in exile in Babylon and hoping that God would come and rescue them, and that then a highway would be made through the wilderness by which God would bring the people back into their home. Is John requesting a building project? Is he trying to raise public works for a new highway? Doubtful. He is rather talking about the paving of a road through the very heart and soul of a people, into the heart and soul of an individual. Prepare the way for the Lord, that he might come through that wilderness, the wilderness of human sin, the wilderness of human brokenness, the wilderness of human disappointment and confusion and fear and anxiety, that he might come into that wilderness and lead us to freedom and to home, that he might bring us home. John was the son of a temple priest. You could have expected to find him in Jerusalem, in the temple precincts, taking up his father's role. But no, here he is in the desert, far away from Jerusalem, far away from the Holy of Holies. And in the Jewish imagination, the further you got from the temple, the further you were from holiness. And so here he is at the River Jordan, the very boundary of the promise which the people crossed following Joshua. The boundary they crossed from outside of the promise in. And here he is baptizing. He is offering a bath, a mikvah bath, in preparation to enter the temple. Of course, the temple is miles away. How are people entering the temple out here in the middle of nowhere? The temple comes to them. Jesus, who is to come out to John to be baptized, is the temple. The one who is coming is not only going to be the conquering emperor, he will also be the great high priest, and he will be the temple itself. Entering his body will be entering the body of holiness. And entering his body is what we do when we are baptized. We become one of the body of Christ one with the temple, one with the priest, one with the king, whose good news is the cross. John is proclaiming something entirely new, entirely strange, a victory that doesn't look like any victory that any human army would ever celebrate, and yet a victory so deep that it shook Rome to its foundations, a victory so deep that it outlasted that mighty empire and every empire that has come since. And that is because it is not an empire built on great armies. It is not an empire built on great cities, out of marble or brick or stone. It is an empire built in the small and the humble, in the local, in the personal. And it begins 
in the human heart. And so in this Advent season, the church reminds us to prepare a way for the Lord. He is coming. He is coming in the birth of the child. He is coming at the end of all time to bring us home. He is coming to us every moment of every day, seeking us, calling us, reaching out to us. Are we prepared? Are we prepared for this good news of the Son of God? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen.